Coming up on the Steve Hill Snow Show, we're bringing you some of the biggest stories in snow sports. We'll be joined by Bryce Bennett, who captured attention on and off the course this past week following a historic performance in Italy. We'll take a closer look at aerial skier Winter Vinecki, one of the most engaging and versatile talents on the circuit. Finally, we'll relive some of the top moments from snowboarding and free skiing at Copper Mountain this past weekend. Welcome back to the Seafill Snow Show. I'm Cara Banks, bringing you the latest in skiing and snowboarding from around the globe. While 2023 is, of course, winding down, the action on the slopes is only ramping up with athletes competing all over the world. So here's a quick look at where members of the U.S. ski and snowboard team were competing this past week. The U.S. aerials team put on an acrobatic show in Chongchuan, China. While the snowboarders and free ski teams stayed close to home at Copper Mountain in Colorado. Trondheim, Norway hosted the cross-country team. Elsewhere in Europe, Para-Alpine took to the slopes in St. Moritz, Switzerland. The Moguls team competed in Alpe d'Huez, France. And the men's Alpine team in Val Gardena, Italy. And we'll talk more about Copper Mountain later in the show. But for now, we're staying in Italy, where Bryce Bennett, a two-time Olympian, delivered one of the biggest stories for the American men this season in downhill skiing, starting at bib number 34. His Paralympian, Rob Snook, on the call. And now the man who won here just a few years ago, American Bryce Bennett, the 31-year-old from Olympic Valley, California. The big man, six foot, seven inches tall. Look at this, he's got the lead by two tenths of a second. Bryce Bennett is on one again today. Here he comes, into the lead! Bryce Bennett from the USA! And the Stiefel U.S. ski team, unbelievable, out of bib number 34. No! And there you see the stunned reaction of the field that includes Switzerland's Marco Odomat, the reigning world champion in downhill, and Norway's Alexander Amok Kilda, the reigning season champion in World Cup downhill. After finishing third in the other downhill race two days later, Bennett is now tied with Kilda atop the Crystal Globe standings. And here's what he had to say about how he'd celebrate that globe. If I get the downhill globe, you will never see me ever again. I am boots off in the finish, on a plane, fishing boat in Mexico. <laughs> I don't know what that says about his expectations for the rest of the season, but we are lucky enough to have Bryce joining us today on the Steve Hill Snow Show. Bryce, thank you so much for being with us and welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Congratulations on the victory. I've got to ask you, two years ago when you won your first World Cup race, you called your then fiance Kelly to tell her the news, but she was asleep. Well, now you're married. How did the call go to your wife this time around? <laughs> yeah, at the time, she was, uh, she was at a friend's graduation out of state. And I called her and she didn't answer. And I was like, she always watches, like what is going on? So I just assumed that she was asleep and turns out she was asleep. So this time she was wide awake and she watched the, uh, the entire race. And she, she actually scared the dog so bad that he ran away. So she had to spend the entire morning looking for the dog. No. Oh, my gosh. You see, you've always got a story to tell, no matter what win it is. So um, <laughs> hopefully the dog, dog, I'm guessing, is back home now. Yeah, the dog's safe and sound. OK, Found good. The dog. <laughs> so you've now won two World Cups at Val Gardena. Tell me, what is it about you and this course that sets up so well? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things. I think Italy, that part of Italy is incredibly beautiful. And I just love being in the Dolomites. The course itself has huge jumps like 60 70 meter jumps and that's just something that comes naturally to me i raced bmx growing up it just kind of i can find the flow of it it's not so much i have to ski these gates perfectly it's like more skier instinct and i think i have that from from growing up at palisades tahoe and free skiing all the time so it just kind of suits my style pretty well 
What did you make of the shot we saw at the end of the race there? Odomat and Kilda, their kind of reaction to you beating them and obviously grabbing the top spot on the podium. Yeah, I mean, Kilda's obviously he won the overall last year in downhill and Odermott's unbelievable. He's the talent of our sport right now. Once the top 30 goes, you don't really expect anyone outside of those start numbers to win the downhill, especially when the conditions are pretty fair and even all the way through the day. I had a pretty rough season last year. It was like struggled all season long. And I worked as hard as I could this summer in the gym, on the snow. And, and that place, it just is confidence inspiring for me. So yeah, I mean, it, it felt good to, to beat those guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it did. Yeah, and that hard work paid off. We heard on the call there that you're six foot seven. I know what it's like to be tall and skiing, but tell me, to be six foot seven racing men's downhill and traveling throughout Europe, are there any kind of issues that you come across, or does it work to your advantage sometimes with speed? Well, it's funny. Today I, w I went to the mall. Uh, I found a pair of jeans that fits. It's unbelievable. A pair of Levi's. I was super excited. But yeah, in general, I mean, I'm I've been six foot seven for a long time now, so it doesn't it doesn't bother me. Plane seats don't bother me. My feet hanging a foot off the bed doesn't bother me. It's just kind of part of the deal these days. Congratulations on on an epic win! Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. I hope you got some time to celebrate, and we can't wait to watch what else you do this season. Yeah, thank you very much. Happy holidays to everyone. After the break, we'll meet one of the most versatile athletes whose name makes you believe she was destined for the snowy slopes. Stay with us on the Steeple Snow Show. Welcome back to the Steeple Snow Show. Fideki made headlines in 2022 as the first Winter Olympian with the first name, Winter. But her story of perseverance and passion began long before, when she lost her father at 10 years old to prostate cancer. This tragedy inspired Vinecki to start Team Winter, raising more than $500,000 to fight prostate cancer and embark on an adventure spanning continents. Here's a look at Vinecki's high-flying tricks and wide-reaching impact. My name is Winter Vanacki. I am an aerial skier and I'm from northern Michigan. If you had a superpower, what would it be? It would be to fly. Aerial skiing is, I think, as close to flying as you can get. We literally are flying through the air, doing a bunch of flips and twists. A lot of people don't know this, but we actually can see most of the time when we're in the air. And so you're just watching the ground where you're going to land. And it is amazing when you stick that. And it's just such a unique feeling. Winter Vanecki. Nice and stretched out. Snails away beautifully. Winter, has your running taken you to different parts of the world? Running has taken me all over the entire globe. I did a world marathon tour for prostate cancer awareness and set the world record for the youngest person to run a marathon on all seven continents before turning 15. We started off in Eugene, Oregon. Then we went to Kenya for marathon number two. Marathon number three, I believe, was Antarctica. Not on this map. <laughs> and then we did the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu, which was in Peru. Then we did Mongolia, way over here. Marathon number six, New Zealand. And then we finished on the original course of the marathon in Athens, Greece. Right, where is it, where is it? Wait for it. Okay, and in here, in Europe. <laughs> Almost nailed it. And Vanecki continues to make a name for herself on the snow, most recently landing a lay full full at the World Cup in China to run away with first place and her first World Cup medal in more than two years. She followed that up one day later with a win in the team event alongside teammates Quinn Dellinger, seen here, and Chris Lillis. The trio also showed off some of their behind-the-scenes skills from the bowling alley with this unique celebration. 
That capped off a great weekend for the Olympic gold medalist Lillis, who also finished second in the men's event. And as if two first place finishes weren't enough for Vinecki, she then celebrated her 25th birthday for 32 hours, thanks to a long day of transcontinental travel from China. Well, now to moguls, where the U.S. women traveled to Alpe d'Huez, France, and continued to highlight their impressive depth. Headlined by Beijing silver medalist Jalen Koff and 23-year-old Olivia Giaccio. Koff's impressive start earned her second place in moguls behind Australia's Jakara Anthony in a repeat of the standings at the Beijing Olympics. Giaccio joined Goff on the podium with a third-place finish. Giaccio then improved on her result the following day with a second-place finish in dual moguls, with Anthony taking first in what is becoming a routine win for the Australian. Rounding out the podium was American Ali Masuga, who posted a career-best performance to win her first ever medal on the World Cup stage, which just so happens to be edible. Moving north now to Trondheim, Norway, where U.S. cross-country skiing once again got big results from veterans Jesse Diggins and Rosie Brennan. The pair entered the week ranked 1-2 in the cup standings and showed up when it mattered most. Diggins finished fourth in the sprint but was not going to leave Trondheim empty-handed. After changing skis, the three-time Olympic medalist made up ground in the freestyle section of the 20-kilometer skiathlon to finish second, recording her fourth World Cup podium finish of the season in the process. Meanwhile, Brennan only got stronger throughout the weekend, posting a second-place finish in the women's 10-kilometer classic en route to her third World Cup medal this season. Diggins finished just behind her in fourth, and three top four finishes in Trondheim helped her maintain first place in the overall standings. So cross-country skiing is off to an impressive start this season, with nine World Cup podium finishes, thanks in large part to Diggins and Brennan. The team also got big results from Ben Ogden and JC Schoonmaker earlier this month, so there'll be two to watch on the men's side. Next up on the Steeple Snow Show, we've got Tom Wallace joining us here in the studio to discuss Alex Ferreira, Eileen Gu, and some of the most exciting personalities in snow sports. Watch this here. Incredible. Let's go! Oh! I think you could say the gauntlet has been thrown. Hey, Mom, love you. Oh, so good. He just goes for it. <laughs> Out of control. If the poles are swinging, the scores are rising. Welcome back. I'm here now with Tom Wallace, the 2013 world champion, of course, in slope style, to discuss what we saw from the skiers at Copper Mountain this past weekend. Tom, thanks for joining us. We're going to start a little bit with um, Alex Ferreira. We spoke about him in last week's show, men's halfpipe. He went and won his second World Cup of the season, this time leading a pack of five Americans at the top of the standings. Can you talk us through what went into his victory? Yeah, I mean, Alex Ferreira is just so hot right now. He's got all the tricks, and his run was the most technical halfpipe run I've maybe ever seen. He's got two 1620s in his run, and that's four and a half rotations. No one else in the field is even doing that trick at this event. So the fact that he can do two of those massive spins is what really stands out. He's just light years ahead on the tricks. Massive spins, big amplitude. I mean, Alex Ferreira, two wins already this season, off to such a hot start. Yeah, just an incredible talent. It'd be fascinating to see what he does, to your point, the rest of the season. Now, among those Americans in the top five was Nick Gepper. What a story he is. A three-time Olympic medalist in slope style, a discipline you know well. Recently announced, though, he was going to return to competition at the age of 29 after previously retiring in January, but this time he's come back in half pipe. So what do you make of the decision to come back and change disciplines and how may it help strengthen the American team? I, it is crazy to me. I mean, I competed against Nick Gepper when I was competing. He's been in the scene so long, three Olympic medals, and then to come back and want to compete in half pipe, it just shows He's such a competitive, talented free skier, and I think he just saw an outlet there. And if the American halfpipe team wasn't already stacked, now there's one more athlete on that team that definitely 
has a chance at a podium. I mean, first half pipe World Cup ever, and he got fourth. So he's something, somebody to watch out for. Incredible, just to be able to switch his talent like that. Let's speak now about one of our international athletes, Eileen Gu. Everyone has gotten to know her, representing China, of course, and she seemingly does it all. She's a student at Stanford. She's a model, a high-end model at that, and, of course, won those two gold medals in her Olympic debut at the Beijing Games. For perspective, she has not lost a final in any event since taking silver in women's slope style at the Beijing Olympics. What makes her so special on the snow? It, I don't understand how she can get it all done. And she spoke to Tina Dixon about this, about how a break from skiing, instead of just being nothing, it's school. Or a break from modeling is skiing. And her ability to kind of do everything in life is just amazing to me. She's focused more on half pipe now solely. So we, we haven't seen her in a big air or slope style like we did in the Olympics in 2022. But I think that focus on half pipe where she's so dominant has allowed her to have some more time to work on school, to do the modeling, to travel to the fashion weeks. It is just, she's such an impressive young woman to be able to do all of this and to be so good at all of it. It's certainly taking advantage of all the seasons. Usually the summer is downtime or training, not for Eileen. No. Mac Forehand, if you were watching, which you, of course, were part of the call, won the Visa Big Air this past weekend in Copper Mountain. Let's take a look then at one of his winning jumps. And can you go into a bit more detail for us? I would love to. Mac Forehand is one of my favorite young kids to watch. He is so talented. We're going to break this one down. He does an 1800 here. But what I want to show you is him getting the grab on the ski. The grab is so important in free skiing to making this trick stand out. And you can see there how he slid the hand up the ski. So he's holding the grab for more degrees of rotation than not. And that's the difference for Mac Forehand compared to some of the other athletes is the fact that he's holding that grab locked in so good and for a majority of the spin, rather than just spinning and then touching the grab, he's holding, tweaking, and the whole rotation. I mean, it's a switch, triple 1800. So it's a lot of counting for me these days, watching these big events and mental math, trying to keep it all together. But that was just picture perfect, and it looks easy for him. It is mind-blowing. And with a name like Mac Forehand, you were going to be doing something pretty talented, I'm sure, with uh, your life and career. Now, one of the challenges, kind of mentioned it a moment ago with Eileen, with snow sports, is you're, you're totally at the whims of the weather. And in the off-season, notably the summer, athletes are known to train using airbags. How do they help replicate the conditions that you're going to face, the extreme conditions, and kind of prepare athletes for, for game time? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So these weren't around when I was younger. So we learned these tricks going straight onto snow, and it was like high impact, getting hurt. Now it's a dry slope jump. So you ski with your ski gear on, but no snow required, and you have a soft airbag to land in. So these athletes can try hundreds and hundreds of times trying a very technical trick without getting hurt. You can land on your face, on your side, on your head, on the bag and pretty much be okay. So it gives you the repetition to train these tricks and then when you finally bring it to a Copper Big Air Grand Prix event, you've done it so many times that your likelihood of landing and preventing injury is a lot better. Yeah, just a kind of a lot safer, less lot risky safer. route to, to, to get up to speed on everything. All right, well, thanks for being with us today, Tom. It's always a pleasure. Up next, we are going to stay at Copper Mountain, but we're going to move to snowboarding. Stay with us on the Stiefel Snow Show. Oh! Typical Red Gerard fashion. That was a beauty. This is the run he was looking for all day long. Matty Mastro, it all comes down to this run right here. Boom. This is a whole different animal. This is big air. Last Friday at Copper Mountain marked the finale for big air snowboarding, leaving Red Gerard one last chance to pick up a World Cup win this season. Here are Todd Harris and Todd Richards on the call. Olympic gold medalist in slope style, Red Gerard, just 23 years of age, will be the next competitor to drop in. He does have the 1800 in his bag of tricks, and here it is right here. Snaps into it. Will Red stomp it? He does. Typical oh. Red Gerard fashion. Puts it down oh, with authority. Coming off a third place at the most recent Big Air World Cup stop in Edmonton, Canada, Red Gerard, that was a beauty. And then what I like about that too, Todd, is how far down he landed 
on the actual yep. landing zone of the jump. Gets that melon grab, clutches it behind his foot. So much whirling going on, opens up, and just pounds that thing into the landing. Whoa. Gerard came just short of overtaking Dutch snowboarder Sam Vermaat and ended in third, collecting his second World Cup medal of the season in as many appearances. For women's big air, Beijing bronze medalist Kokomo Morase made history as the first woman to land the backside triple cork 1440 in competition. Morase beat out her Japanese teammate Mari Fukada and Great Britain's Mia Brooks to secure her fifth career World Cup win at just 19 years old. Another Olympic champion came up clutch in men's halfpipe. Japan's Ayumu Hirano entered his final attempt of the day out of podium position following two rocky rounds. But the 25-year-old had one of the most complicated tricks up his sleeve, the triple cork 1440. He landed it to open the run and held on to win his first event since the Beijing Games. Half-pipe snowboarder Maddie Mastro continues to establish herself as the top contender for the Americans in Chloe Kim's absence. Mastro recorded a third-place finish at the World Cup for the fourth time this calendar year. And at the Para-Alpine World Cup in St. Moritz, three-time Paralympian Andrew Kirker finished fourth in the sitting downhill event. Meanwhile, 19-year-old Jesse Keefe snuck into the top five in the standing downhill event. And we'll wrap up today's episode by getting in the holiday spirit with Canadian snowboarder Sebastian Toutant. The 2018 Big Air Olympic champion teamed up with Eric Ramirez for a snowy showdown between Santa and the Grinch. Well, here's a look at what's coming up in the snow sports on the networks of NBC. Catch Michaela Schifrin and the women's tech team in Austria next Thursday and Friday. That's on Peacock. We'll be back with you in 2024 on January 6th with a special hour-long edition of the Steeple Snow Show. Until then, I'm Cara Banks saying so long for now and Merry Christmas.